contracts are a meeting of minds, and minds being a, deriv a derivative of the soul, which means you're contracting two souls together. Welcome to Inspiral Out Loud, where we are exploring ways to create a thriving world for all sentient. So it's been quite a while, but I'm back here with Mars today. We were going to be having um, having a new series of chats about life, the universe, and everything. Hi, Mars. How are you doing? Hi, Tony. I'm very good. How are you doing? <laughs> I'm doing great. So nice it's to be. To again. Yes, nice to be in the Zoom space with you again. So today, um, I'd love to chat about. Um, about a little mini revelation that, that came up a couple of days ago. I actually posted a, a short video on this yesterday. Uh, it was regarding, uh, actually, law and legal. Now, I've been working on a series of um, healing sequences, I guess you could call it, called the spiral matrix, and we've been working on all sorts of different things. Um, from health and money, education, the, the world at large, history, all sorts of different facets of the world. But I've been finding that some aspects are still just getting stuck. And one of the easiest to see around that is money. So I, I was just looking into that a little bit more and suddenly I had the idea to start to look at the inverse because all of the clearing we've been doing has been on the realms of our personal fields, working in the ancestral realms, um, clearing ourselves of trauma, all of this kind of stuff. Um, but when we're dealing with things like with money, with ownership, with titles, with agreements, with anything like that, as far as I understand it, we're actually working with the dead person or the, the corporate person, the part of us that's kind of like our other twin um, that is not actually us. That's about the best way that I can explain it. And so by actually then starting to do the healing work on that corporate version of us that our birth certificate and so on is, um, is created in, then that should theoretically affect um all of then the, the the contracts the agreements our ability to generate money as opposed to wealth the actual money and things like that anyway that's that's the realm that I'm playing in and so I'm interested in in your perspective from from the law perspective, because um, you know so much more about this than me, I know nothing. Um, <laughs> but just really curious to know to know your insights on that. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, idea. I've never actually heard anyone talk about this before uh, anywhere, and I know people, many people in. You know, sort of the, the law research communities, and I've never heard anyone discuss this. I, I've just I've talked about the spiritual realm with people in the mystery school traditions, and I've never heard anything like it. And I find it very interesting because I met a man. I won't give his name actually because I think he he's basically gone off off grid entirely. He was one one of very few people I know of that actually took complete control over his person. So he's in command of it now. And he told us as a group when he was coaching us on various things, if he never returns to meetings, that's because he's left and he can't talk to us anymore. Otherwise he gets arrested. Uh, so what he told us about the whole spiritual relationship to law, the law versus legal that you mentioned is, uh, he, he represented it on a slide in a presentation and the, it was basically a photograph of someone with a mirror. 
and one side was the real and the other was the corporate fiction world and he called it the public and the private so the private is actually the living and the public is the dead in other words your birth certificate which is kind of interesting because it was also represented financially as the top two squares open squares of the christian cross as opposed to an equal sided cross such as the Templar crosses as colloquial known or the cross parte. So that he, def he, def he described it as a ledger and it wasn't just, oh, that sounds like an interesting symbol to, to or a metaphor to represent this knowledge. It was actually derived from extensive research, biblical research and so on. He also mentioned in relation to that a concept that I believe he said was in, contained in the Bible, although I've never found it and not spent much time looking for it. But he said, the passage was, when the kingdoms unite, the crown will return. Now, if you talk to people that were interested in kingdoms, you might mistakenly assume that it meant when several kingdoms, divided kingdoms, unify the crown will return, except that the passage he got it from, now you have to remember that he told me this seven, eight years ago, so it's quite a while, so a bit of the detail is lost. But the nutshell of that was he described that as when you unify your living with your person, you essentially symbolically buy the crown return to sovereignty as an individual correction as a man or a woman um so i thought that was a very interesting description someone in the in the meeting actually asked so what about the bottom two squares he said i'm not talking about that the reason i think he was saying that he's not going to talk about it is because the, it's the bottom two squares in the ledger is where you can actually generate money out of nothing which is criminal it's probably why he refused to describe how to do it he does know so what's interesting about that idea is that of course the, the living has a spiritual component we have a soul that's what was pretty much universally accepted we have a soul an eternal component of our being and then we have symbolically the dead, the living and the dead, or the public and the private. You can use many symbols and metaphors for that. Now, I don't think that this means that we have a dead that has a soul. That's, um, I think that would be a bit of a strange idea. But the people that created this whole system of slavery, known as the birth certificate system, are occultists. And many of them have the, their philosophy is the Masonic type philosophy of the black and the white, the good and the evil, and the necessity for both. They believe this. I don't, I don't buy it. I don't think that there's a necessity for evil. This is just an, almost an excuse to me. But they design systems because these people are not actually very creative in the, in the, arts sense they are creative in making parallels and analogies and symbolism and i think what they've done is taken an old symbolism that was actually supposed to be to explain our psychology for the most part our human nature or the nature of man mankind symbolically representing it as we have choices good and evil white and black I think they've taken that concept and constructed a birth certificate system around it. Because as they say, when you know the symbolism of these societies, you see it everywhere. It's, society is absolutely rife with it everywhere. And so it, it seems that's the logical progression that they would follow the same, um, same system of symbolism in everything that they do, because they're not that creative. But what is interesting is when you think about what a contract is, which is what a birth certificate ultimately is, with the contract between your parents as informants with the state to hand over title, 
contracts are a meeting of minds, and minds being a, deriv a derivative of the soul, which means you're contracting two souls together. So why it's interesting what you talked about with the spiritual component tied with these certificates is actually very interesting because, because I can see it's not directly with the trust, although who are we to say? I mean, historically, people have always held strong beliefs in things like talismans and amulets that are energetically um, empowered to either protect or harm. Who's to say that occultists don't do the same thing with birth certificates? I wouldn't well, be my, the least bit surprised. Right. Well, because my question around that is that surely almost anything can actually be cursed. Is I imagine that anything could be cursed. So if all of our birth certificates, all of the pieces of paper literally uh, representing the corporate entities of us, if those were cursed to keep us enslaved, then although it's not cursing our living person, is that not then potentially cursing any bank accounts, any titles, any contracts, any kinds of agreements, like any of our interactions with any other uh, facet of that of that corporate dead legal world? Yeah, that makes most logical sense because it's a piece of paper. It's actually more than just a piece of paper. It's, I mean, the, the physical piece of paper. If you curse it, I'm just thinking of an example of a man who was around in the 60s and I think 70s. He started talking publicly all over America and various places. And there's a lot of, he's a very, um, <laughs> there's a lot of debate about whether this man is legitimate or not, but he was certainly talking about things that people really didn't talk about for another 10 years with the likes of Jordan Maxwell and so on, talking about the occult and how it all operates and things. So you have to take everything with a grain of salt. He did say some pretty out there things. But one of the things he did talk about was he used to work for a record label and he claimed to be in the uh, Council of 13, which is, for anyone who's into conspiracy theories, is believed to be the Council, Supreme Council that runs the world. Well, maybe. But he talked about what they would do with master records because the occultists that, that he claimed that he was operating for were, all, he were also um, involved in what he calls witchcraft, which by any other name is occultism, you can call it what you like. And he talked about when they would run a master copy, um, when it was back in the days of just LPs, records on vinyl, they would take the master before they started printing the vinyls and do an occult ritual over it to de command demonic entities to follow every print made from that master. And the idea was that they absolutely despised Christianity as a whole and they wanted to destroy it. And their thinking was if they can't convince people to take things voluntarily that, you know, um, you know, occult books or anything that they could imbue with a demonic entity, they would surreptitiously do it by encouraging people to, to buy records, even Christian records. You know, there was a big era of Christian rock. They put curses over those too, apparently. Now, how so long ago? Be... Sorry, how long ago are we talking about? Is this when, like, the next level of um, of production came in, in like around the nineties, or are you talking older than that? No. Older than that. This he was talking about which bands in particular, and he said any of the big bands. And at the time, he mentioned the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, you know, all the sixties bands, all the ones that were really popular and popular and heavily promoted in, in the uh, radio circuit, those were all the ones that they would specifically target because they just wanted as many records in as many homes as possible to degrade Christianity specifically because they despise it. And they always have. Um, I don't know how long it actually, according to him, was going, what point they started this, but presumably, 
probably pretty close to the beginning of when distributed distribution of music became a big project. It's like everything. They, t- they look at an industry and see how can we use this to our advantage? And then they go up and buy those industries up over time. Yeah. So it's not like it. It's not likely it started from the get-go. It probably crept in as they started buying up major record labels and radio stations and print media and all of that. So back to the point of it, I I think, yes, it's perfectly feasible, but if if they believe that this is possible and they went to the effort, maybe it's also true with the birth certificate system. Mm, yeah, it's what and, I would do if I was a crazy person. <laughs> well, because I mean, the curious thing about it is that in in the spiral matrix work that we're doing, we're we're actually drawing curses. Well, at least this is the intent of it. Um, the intent of it is one of the aspects of it is is to draw curses out and cleanse curses out of the realms of all of the different facets of the world that we're playing in, right? And so, and and so most of those are organisational or they're societal or they're elemental. Like most of them are not actually human structures, but it feels and it looks like it's making some kind of energetic difference. And I don't know exactly what that is yet because we're just kind of we're the blind leading at the blind at the moment, and this is still a process of exploration. And so this conversation is coming out of a process of exploration and we're, and we're still like right in, in the midst of it as in we just did like one healing session this morning on the, the personal, uh, on, on the, um, the legal person of the self. And so as that work evolves, then I'll share more insights of that. Um, but it, it just feels like, that this just feels like a little bit of cracking the code. That's what I said yesterday. I, d- I just feel like we, we've just hit a little something that potentially is really going to help unravel so much of the stranglehold that, that we've been playing in, including including the internet. I mean, we're getting a sudden influx of um, of people being shut down and censored right now. We've, we've heard of two or three people in the last like, couple of days that, that suddenly seems to be, you know, arcing up a little bit. Um, so it'll be very curious to see how all of these things play out. You mentioned something the other day about Jesus and, um, and his function as a high priest, and somehow that was related to this as well. Do you remember what that was? Oh, uh, yes, that was, um, so it was talking about the origins of, of Christianity and how it evolved into the system of um, what that symbolic meaning is of when the kingdoms unite, the crown will return. Um, and we were talking about um, Egypt and its relationship to Christianity. The interesting thing about the origins of Christianity, because we know, for example, that the modern form of the religion, the formalized religion, basically dominated by the Vatican or the Roman Catholic Church, was a hybrid of many things so you've got to look at the history of where it all started in its modern uh, invention so it was basically emperor constantine who uh, by the end of his life i believe he actually did convert truly to christianity in his in his beliefs but politically that was dangerous christianity was a big threat at the time and it was causing a lot of squabble between the what most would probably refer to as pagan beliefs you know, you've got the old multiple gods and you know the greek gods the roman gods and this new idea proposed by the master jesus and it was at it was at odds so they had to come up with something to satisfy and that 
is why you see so many pagan similarities in modern Christianity. You know, why the celebration is on Earth, Jesus' birth is at a time when it's known that wasn't, he wasn't actually born in December at all. Um, that is related to astrological things, which of course is related to the old pagan beliefs, gods representing planets and so on and so forth, astrotheology in other words. But when you look at the origins of Jesus' teachings, that actually is all very much in parallel with the teachings that are written on all the walls in all the temples of ancient Egypt. There's even references to the Arcs of the Covenant, and I specifically say Arcs plural because there was not one, there was actually many. Each temple had its own Ark. All the major temples had their own Ark. Um, so what was the tradition that Jesus was teaching? Well, he's known to be the high priest of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Um, that tradition, periodically, they would put out, they would handpick one teacher to go out to the masses and teach a simplified version of what the high priesthood all understood about the nature of the universe, our nature, everything. And it was not a secret back then. It was literally written on the walls in the temples, everything about it. There might have been a few specifics that were kept private, you know, initiation rituals for the pharaohs and, and so on and the queens. But they would do this because people were back then, you know, not very literate. Most people couldn't read and write. That was a luxury. That was a privilege. You had to have the spare time to learn to read and write. And hieroglyphs are not an easy thing to understand. So that's why they would put forward these, these teachers periodically. Now, does this defy the idea that Jesus was actually God incarnate? No, not necessarily. It doesn't. It's actually got no bearing on it. So for those who are of a very devout Christian bent, please don't be offended. Um, but if you look at the teachings, you'll find that he was, in fact, one of those masters put forward. So what you will actually discover by that line is that the origins of Christianity actually come from ancient Egypt and then from previous civilizations before ancient Egypt. So we're actually talking about one of the oldest traditions in history. So all other traditions actually come later, which is very interesting. So arguably Christianity is the oldest religion in the world. So does that does that mean that that's where the 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 saying that writings on the wall came from? <laughs> the, the writing was literally on the wall. <laughs> uh, yeah, very well. <laughs> so so this is so this is really interesting. Now what what I'd love to do is have another have another chat in a few days when we've done a little bit more work on um, a, a bit more of the inner work on this. But I, what I imagine is that within within all of this, so we've spoken about curses and stuff, I'm sure that there are then remedies, which is what we're ultimately interested in exploring. So what I'd like to do is explore the remedies from an internal perspective and then um, chat with you again about this soon, about the remedies from a, perhaps a religious and a lawful perspective. No problem, let's tee it up. Mm, all right, sounds That's good. Nice. Very good. All right, we've got to go so I can get this this recording downloaded before our internet goes off. Thank you so much for joining us today and look forward to chatting to you again soon, Mars. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. All right, and for all you good people at home, look forward to seeing you again soon. Till next time, my friends. Be well and keep dreaming a good dream. Ciao for now. Said I got to wake up now. Baby sleeping up this way.